This comes from Luke 7. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, Hmm, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterwards, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Shusa, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their resources. Thus ends the holy reading. We ask that God help us in our understanding and our ability to live accordingly. Would you please sit down? I started out in one direction with a sermon and then did a U-turn and then straightened back up again. So forgive me if it's a little convoluted, but it sort of reads the way that scripture read. The scripture shows us that only Christ can forgive our sins. Most of you have heard of the story of the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. She is the one who's been forgiven much and has much for which to show gratitude. Jesus compares her with Simon the Pharisee and the others around the table and their gratitude is sadly lacking. In the midst of the dinner shared, custom, judging spirits, misinformation, and self-righteousness are interwoven with a story of forgiveness, new possibilities, and extravagant expression of gratitude. And at the end, there is hope for a future, a hope for the woman, a hope for Simon, and for us as well. Now, a similar version of this story shows up in all the other Gospels, but this one's a little bit different. It doesn't have the overtones of preparing for Jesus' death. It is simply hospitality, gratitude, and forgiveness. The perfume she brings, she brings herself, which would have cost an awful lot in that day and time. It is, as I said before, an extravagant expression of gratitude. Now, 
this is a very different story in its emphasis because we are still looking forward to the ministry of Jesus and not to his death and resurrection. There's still hope, even in the midst of this story, where the classism lines itself out about who's important and who isn't. And also the judgmental uh, part that people who believe themselves to be above sin reach out and smear others with that brush. We meet up with these people as they gather at or near the table with Jesus. A lot of the pictures about this show Jesus reclining on what amounts to a sofa and others around him. History tells us that there would not have been a table but cushions on which they sat and if there was a table present it was just barely off the floor. Jesus has been invited by Simon the Pharisee and the reason that Simon invited him is probably multi-level but one is that he knows enough about Jesus to at least be curious. He's heard of the things he does and as a Pharisee he knows Jesus is a rabbi and therefore is worthy to be invited to the Pharisee's house and would be a welcome participant at dinner for the conversation. And the fact that Jesus accepted the invitation says that he knew enough about Simon to at least know where to go for dinner. Now, Simon gives us some pretty clear ideas of the kinds of restrictions his faith labors under. That the law is still primary and one must earn one's salvation. He knows that this woman doesn't live up to that, and he's quite frankly shocked that Jesus would have any interaction with her at all. What we know as the readers of this is that Jesus already knows the history of this woman and understands about forgiveness and even sees the possibility of forgiveness for Simon. The woman has a history with Jesus, otherwise why would she come and spend all her money and her tears coming into a place where as a woman she was not invited and not welcome and ministering to a holy man, a teacher, a rabbi. She had to have some reason to feel grateful and not just a teeny tiny bit of gratitude but grateful in a huge way. She had to know she wouldn't be welcomed at the dinner party. I mean, that was part of their culture. She had to know that ordinary boundaries would have kept her out and nowhere near Jesus. And yet, she came in and she encountered Jesus. And she did so with a lot of what we today might call chutzpah. You see, that quiet dinner where they were discussing all kinds of things was interrupted by um, this woman. The expectations for the night were just tossed away. And until verse 40, we hear no word from Simon and we hear no word from Jesus. But then in verse 40, Jesus breaks the silence by addressing Simon, apparently out of the blue, calling him on what he's thinking. Because as Simon is thinking that Jesus obviously isn't a prophet because he would know what kind of woman she was, Jesus is thinking, I know this woman, I know what her sins are. And to Simon to tell the parable that he does, to say that her sins are forgiven on a much higher level because she truly is appreciative. She has faith that this man, Jesus, is the Lord. Simon is still trying to figure it out. And so it is he who receives the lesser of the forgiveness, the lesser of the bounty. Now, Jesus takes what happens and turns it around, as Jesus always did, reframes it from 
looking at it in God's eyes. Here is a woman who offered the hospitality that Simon had either forgotten or simply didn't think was important for Jesus. Here is a woman of faith who, by all accounts, is who society would push to the outside. And here is a woman who, more than anything in the world, wanted to say thank you, and thank you in a very generous manner. It's reframing those things that helps us to see what God understood in that encounter and what in our lives sometimes we take for granted as being truth and when God turns it upside down shows us to be lacking also. Jesus says that this woman not only was seen and accepted and forgiven but the better partner in this scenario. Now, verse 47, Jesus draws a conclusion based on the extravagance of that outpouring of hospitality. And Simon's own conclusion from the parable that the one who would love more would be the one for whom greater debt was canceled. And so Jesus' message is she would love more, Simon and the others less. And it comes wrapped up in a neat little package called forgiveness. Faith and salvation and hospitality and love and forgiveness are what Christ came for. And it's made possible not only for this woman, but also for all of those in the room and around that table. It is for those whom our communities refuse to see. And it is from us when we can step out of our little perspectives and see things the way God would. Now, if forgiveness is one piece of the meaning of the story of Luke, then the second is faith. Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, so we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ. And then later he says, and I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is the understanding, whether she knows it or not, that this woman has when she comes to Jesus. It is echoed in Jesus' pronouncement to the forgiven woman, your faith has saved you. It's the faith that sets us all onto a path of new life. It's interesting to note that Simon the Pharisee is not named again after this, and one has to wonder where he went. Did he learn and change and become a disciple? Or did he continue on his own self-righteous way? We don't know. All we know is that the invitation to grace, the invitation to forgiveness, the invitation to live a faith-filled life has been given to him, just like it's been given to each one of us. Now, this reading was about a lot of unknowns. It was about forgiveness. It was about Moving on, it was about faith, it was about love, it was about all sorts of things. You as a congregation are facing yet another unknown. Last week, you celebrated Trish, and she is getting her stuff together and moving. You will soon, in July, celebrate Kate and bring her into your family of faith, which is, after all, Christ's family of faith. I will be here two more Sundays only, and in that time I'm going to make some suggestions about how to make a new pastor feel welcome. I know because I worked really hard on helping the church to understand it was their job to make her feel welcome, to get her 
on board with what happens here, not for her to come in search of you all. So the first thing I'm going to say is, please keep coming to church. If you're on vacation, fine, but when vacation's over, come back to church. She needs to know that she's going to have more than a handful of people for the summer and into the fall. You also need to do some personal things for her. I like that the office was painted. I like that bright yellow wall especially. It should be in order, and there should be flowers on her desk for the first time she comes. With notes, if you want to leave notes, the children can make notes for her. I had enough notes when I left to pay for a bathroom, a large one. But I went through everyone, read through everyone, and cherished every one. She will, too, because it is her first introduction to your children, and especially since Sunday school is finished for the summer. The same with the youth. And youth, be as present as you have been in the congregation. I know some of you have offered to sing. There's other ways you could be of use, too, so please do that. She's looking for a place to live. When she finds one, send her notes of welcome, even if it's after she's gotten here, and God forbid that it should be that late. But send her a note and say, we are looking forward to you as our new pastor. We don't know what the future holds, but we hope you love Epworth as much as we do, or something along those lines. When you are working with her, don't say, Trish, always did it this way or Bill always does it this way or that interim we had started doing things this way wait to be asked how it was done and then refrain from using names when you talk about it introduce her to your family let her know where you sit and then the second and third and fourth and fifth week after that, tell her your name again and where you sit. And I know you're laughing because almost all of you sit in the same place every single week. The main thing to remember is the main thing is God Christ's spirit, not us, not you, not the church, not any pastor that comes. The main thing is worshiping the Lord for whom the church was built in the first place. I hope SPRC, I planted a seed earlier, is planning some sort of a celebration for her first Sunday here. It doesn't have to be a great big wing ding, just a little something to let her know you appreciate her. And have dinner ready on her move-in day and have somebody prepared to take it to her. That means SPRC has to coordinate and find out what day, which is the 22nd, find out the address, and maybe something of what she eats. I don't know if she's a vegetarian or a pure meat person, but a home-cooked meal. For me, it was complete with Diet Coke. Makes all the difference. Now... I know that much has happened in the last few weeks, and many of us are reeling from that and from other things. But the Church of Jesus Christ goes on regardless of who your pastor is. I've enjoyed being here. I will enjoy my next two weeks. And I'm sure Kate will once she comes. So, do your job, church. Be the welcoming. Share the hospitality that Jesus didn't get. You don't have to cry and wipe her feet or anything like that, but be hospitable. And on that first Sunday, don't just stare at her like, who the heck are you? Speak. Say your name and smile. When you're sitting and listening to her, occasionally smile so she knows you're not sitting there planning her demise. <laughs> You've changed pastors off enough to know this. It's a hard row, but it is what it is, and I trust you all to do as Jesus said. Be thankful. Show your gratitude. Be faithful in all things. 
and praise God. Amen.